Tonight on our news, back to class as day two of the 2022-2023 academic year. The resources for students with special needs straight ahead. A deadly dog attack leaves a community in shock. Also, a man set to stand trial for the murder of an eight-year-old boy is granted bail for a second time. Plus, remember in Dorian, our team coverage of Road to Recovery continues. Welcome to our news and thank you so much for joining us. I'm Natalia Hall. It's day two of the 2022-2023 academic year for thousands of students who are, for the first time in two years, back in the classroom for full face-to-face -face learning. Officials say the return to campuses across the country will continue in phases and health protocols remain in place. In a moment, we'll tell you about plans for special needs students this year and an appeal for more resources. But first, a community laugh in shock after a man was discovered mauled to death by a pack of dogs. The tragic attack has left officials pressing for stricter regulations and owners with questions about how they can comply. Our Marlena Leonard is following this tonight. Following this weekend's fatal dog attack, we spoke to Minister of Agriculture Clay Sweeting about the regulations that are in place for dog owners. He also says he's been in talks with the Animal Protection Board. Nationwide, um, we have very few dogs as licensed um, that adhere to, to the legislation. The minister says right now the licensing process has to be in person and only requires a trip to the Treasury to pay the estimated $2 licensing fee. The next step is picking up a license tag at the Department of Agriculture. In response to our asking if there's an online option, the minister says he hopes that will be included in the ongoing digitization of his ministry and that it was one of many suggestions presented to him by the Animal Protection Board. For the first time in um, probably 10 years or more, um, we do have an active Animal um, Protection Board that is meeting regularly. Dr. Kwesi Smith is a veterinarian at the Marathon Veterinary Clinic, but he's also a member of the Animal Protection Board. A wealth of knowledge is on the board and we have a lot of work to do. As a seasoned veterinarian, Dr. Smith also drives home the importance of understanding the responsibility and commitment of owning a dog. A lot of people complain about the requirements for adopting animals, but these animals need proper shelter, properly enclosed yards, right? It's, I know it's going to be difficult, but again, it's, it's, for the, it's for the main goal of protection and health of the animal. And of course, proper pet enclosures and shelter can also help protect the greater community from attacks like the unfortunate events of Saturday morning. Reporting for Our News, I'm Marlena Leonard. Thanks so much for that report, Marlena. And we are now two days into the 2022-2023 academic year. And education officials are saying this year they are putting more attention on special needs students across the country. During her back-to-school tour, Education Minister Glennis Hatter-Martin telling our news that students with special needs have been a long-neglected demographic and says her ministry is striving for more resources, including teachers. We have a deficit in special needs teachers during the virtual education instruction. Those students would not have been able to cope appropriately because the, the, the modality of teaching special needs children, the virtual reality would not have been suitable. And so they would have really, really um, been denied during this period. So we want to ensure that we create um, spaces in, all, in, in as many schools as possible for special needs children and that we have the appropriately trained teachers to ensure that those children, where, it's, where it can happen, that they can be self-sufficient um, and they can be able to manage themselves in their own lives. As for the industrial agreement between government and the Bahamas Union of Teachers State Minister for the Public Service, Pia Glover Roll, expressing optimism that the agreement will be signed soon. BUT President Belinda Wilson calling off planned industrial action last week, although her union has been operating on an agreement that expired in 2019. Glover Roll saying that both sides are closer than ever to inking a new agreement. We are very close to signing the document is now with the financial secretary. We're just clearing up a few financial articles and I would anticipate that we should hear back from him today. So in short order, we should be able to sign and bring that industrial agreement to conclusion. 
Meanwhile, the state public service minister is setting an ambitious goal for the first anniversary of the party's victory, saying she plans to wrap up several agreements in just over two weeks. I know that we are currently in negotiations with BPSU, um, Customs, Immigration and Allied Workers Union. Those are basically coming to an end. BUT is completed. Um, I know that the other quasi-government agencies are also in negotiations with some of their TB, unions. TB, before TB, September, TB, TB. before our first anniversary, we hope that we could sign at least four more. Um, and I think that it's looking good. Scattered showers and high temperatures around the country. Meteorologist Greg Thompson joins us now with our latest weather conditions, plus what you should keep an eye out for later this week. Good evening, Greg. Yeah, thanks, Natalia. Nice conditions outside our studios right now if you plan on doing anything on the outdoors. Temperatures comfortable in the low 80s, 84 right now with partly cloudy skies. It's a little bit humid out there. Your winds are east, southeast at 9 miles per hour and your feels like temperature. Uh, comfortable 89 degrees, a little on the warm side, but comfortable still. Tropical wave, the northern extends of that, interacting with an upper level disturbance or low, moving across the southeast Bahamas, triggering some showers and some cloudiness across portions of the central and southeast Bahamas. A couple of isolated showers and thunderstorms associated with that system as it continues to pull towards the uh, west. And uh, northwest Bahamas, not too bad, but all this will be moving towards the west overnight and into tomorrow. So we're looking at increasing showers and chance of some isolated thunderstorms across the northwest Bahamas tomorrow as well. But once the system gets out, conditions will be improving for the balance of the week. That's your first look at weather. Your extended forecast is still to come. Thanks so much, Greg. Still to come on our news, a man who is set to stand trial for the 2017 murder of an eight-year-old boy is granted bail. And we continue our coverage of Hurricane Dorian and the people whose lives it impacted three years later. Plus, how tourism officials plan on doubling Cat Island's visitor arrivals. That's coming up when our news returns. What we're doing is we seem to be saying to 80% of the student population, you're really not good enough. The PGCSE is a bohemian exam. Your average is going to be around that high point, which is the D. Schools are churning out 5,000 children a year that need jobs. We're producing generations of bohemians whose goal is to get out. A judge has reinstated bail for the man accused of the 2017 murders of 23-year-old Dennis Moss and 8-year-old Eugene Woodside Jr. Justice Cheryl Grant Thompson granted Lloyd Minnis $20,000 bail saying he had spent three years on remand and that she was satisfied that he would appear for his trial that's set to begin on January 23, 2023. Now this is the second time Minnis' bail was restored after it was revoked for breaching the conditions of of his release. On September 25, 2017, EJ was doing homework in his Chippenham home when gunfire erupted outside. As an assailant pursued Moss, Moss was shot and killed, while the bullets also penetrated EJ's home, striking and killing him. Minnis, the alleged getaway driver, was charged, while the alleged shooter remains at large. We are winding down to the third anniversary of what has been described as the worst Atlantic hurricane in history. Our Road to Recovery team coverage continues tonight with our Bertany McDermott in Abaco and Jamila Mizik in Grand Bahama. We'll get to you both in a moment as we begin with Megan Shepard, who's also following some residents in Abaco in a series called Where Are They Not Now? Rather, tonight, a shelter manager recounts his experience and shares his hopes for the future. Picture over 24 hours of wind at 180 miles per hour, with gusts peaking at 220 miles per hour. Heavy downpours of rain for days, the sounds of trees breaking, homes collapsing, and even boats being tossed around. Sarone Kennedy was working as a shelter manager for decades and says what unfolded as Hurricane Dorian made landfall, not even Hollywood could have written. Water was coming in under the doors, um, and part of the building collapsed in the back. We couldn't get out. I would not open the door to go to try to help them for a fear we may get sucked out or something may come in. 
Kennedy recalls 300 people pouring into the shelter seeking refuge during the first half of the storm after the passing of the eye, and just 100 remained. In December of 2020, the then Free National Movement government broke ground on a hurricane shelter and community center in Central Pines. It is my desire that the uh, proposed shelter across the road there is finished in the near future because we don't know when the next one is coming. Some three years later, he says the island remains in critical condition. We still have people sleeping in their cars. We still have people in tents. We still have people in domes. We still have people in the mobile homes. Despite the life-altering events of Hurricane Dorian and the responsibility he bore for hundreds of lives, Kennedy says he would absolutely do it again. Reporting for Our News, I'm Megan Shepard. And while many are trying to rebuild homes and businesses three years after Hurricane Dorian, others have managed to make a comeback. But many are still dealing with the emotional and mental impact. Our team on Abaco speaking with one resident who survived Dorian and then a plane crash, reliving the harrowing tale when he spoke with our Berthony McDermott, who joins us now. Berthony, the resident saying making the decision to remain on the island was a big mistake? That's right, Italia. Cedric Bullitt, a man who survived Hurricane Doreen and then a plane crash, is also suggesting Bahamians add something significant to their list in preparation for future hurricanes. Instead of just worrying about um, having food and stuff like that and water to, 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 um, uh, to survive during the storm, Life waste. Yeah. People need not to get invested in life waste. That was Bishop Cedric Bullard's emotional suggestion as the country goes through another hurricane season. Bullard and his family spent Hurricane Dorian hunkered down in their church, which along with his home was severely damaged. The family lost everything. That was one of the worst of the worst mistakes anyone in Africa would have made in their lives because we have never had that kind of wind, we've never had that kind of rain, we've never had that kind of lightning, we've never seen so many tornadoes. You know, it was just different. You know, it was just different. So it was a terrible experience. He says among the people in the church with him was his two daughters-in-law with newborn babies. Bullard says today moving forward is still hard for his family. While he's managed to repair his home and church, he says the impact of the storm still remains. To see these babies in this wet, everything was just wet. I couldn't go home. That was totally gone. But even this building, if you notice you're here in this church and this got a floor down below, what a sat in this building, you know what I mean? Because it rained from the top down. So we just had to find a dry lit environment, and we, live, we lived in the, in the wet, in the, in, I mean, there's nothing dry. Hurricane Doreen was a Category 5 hurricane packing up to 185 miles per hour winds. Less than a year after the storm, Bullitt and his family crash landed his plane in Abaco, but he says the experience could not compare. You all know my story, I had a crash, and the crash was better than Doreen. Again, Italia, while he and his family has managed to rebuild, Bullard says they're just thankful they all survived. Reporting live from Abaco, I'm Berthany McDermott. Back to you, Italia. Thanks so much for that report, Berthany. Now, the small fishing village of Sweetings Key is still in recovery mode. Three years after Dorian made landfall on the key, many of those residents who remained there were forced to sleep in tents as reconstruction efforts dragged on. Our Jamila Mizek spoke to residents there who say although the key is starting to return to normalcy, there's still much more work to be done. Italia, 30 adults and seven children were on Sweetings Key during Hurricane Dorian, and fortunately, all of them survived. But some three years later, many of them still remain fearful, and they say should another storm arise, they will not remain on the key. Of course, what have you been through the last hurricane? Hurricane Dorian? Uh, best tell me, I've been the first one off of Swing King. Austin Duncan Jr., Hugh Lynn Davis, and Leonard Feaster all survived Hurricane Dorian on Sweetings Key. The men weathered the storm together as rising water levels flooded the key. That experience, I'll never want to see that again, no more. 
I was in the water for three days straight. When I come down, I was on the boat stop. I swim through the water to get to the boat. But God saved me and uh, three others. Davis says it was almost a week before help arrived. When the chopper started coming over, we had nothing to eat and nothing to drink. And they started bringing food to us and water and so forth. And we had three old people there, plus seven children. And not a soul got missing, not a soul gone. So God was with me, and this line would sink with water. This line would sink. The men say they lost everything. Three years later, both Davis and Feaster have new homes thanks to the Rotary organization. But Feaster says there's much more to be done on the key. Basically, all the funds we had, we lost all the things we had below us, so get back to square one. The job, you know, jobs here like that. Davis says he's happy to see the return of some sort of normalcy. Everybody coming back home when we build a home and build the place back up again. Everybody trying to get back home. We ain't quit home now. Now, while the men are grateful for the assistance they've received so far, the general consensus is that there is still much more help needed there on the key. Reporting live from Grand Bahama, I'm Jamila Mizek. Italia, back to you. Thanks so much, Jamila. Now, our Jamila Mizek in Grand Bahama and our Berthony McDermott in Abaco. Our road uh, coverage, rather, of Road to Recovery Hurricane Dorian three years later continues tomorrow. When our news comes back from the break, big plans to bring more visitors to Cat Island. And more basketball action tonight straight ahead in sports. Marcellus Hall is standing by now in studio. All right, plus uh, Talia coming up in sports for you tonight. We'll tell you a little bit more about our men's national basketball team as they had a bit of a rough outing against Argentina. Um, UB men's soccer squad, well, they're staying hot. 2-0 now in preseason action. All that coming up. In sports. Thanks, Marcellus. And staying connected, another public park gets Wi Fi. We have the details when our news returns. What we're doing is we seem to be saying to 80% of the student population, you're really not good enough. The PGCSE is a behemoth exam. Your average is going to be around that high point, which is the D. Schools are churning out 5,000 children a year that need jobs. We're producing generations of Bahamans whose goal is to get out. This is our news. Welcome back. A tourism office is now open on Cat Island. Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Tourism Chester Cooper calling it the first step in attracting more visitors to the island. Cooper says there are also plans to launch a targeted marketing plan and upgrade Cat Island's airport in hopes of surpassing that island's visitor arrivals, which stood at 1,749 visitors last year. We made a commitment to deepen investment in tourism, particularly in the family islands, and this opening is yet another promise fulfilled. This new BTO is the eighth tourism office outside of the Providence and Grand Bahama, and this is my first tourism office that I am opening as Minister of Tourism. Our men's national basketball team still looking for a win at the World Cup qualifiers. Meanwhile, the UB soccer team stays hot. Marcellus Hall joins us in studio now with more on this. Marcellus? All right, thanks, Natalia. Welcome to our sports, everybody. I'm Marcellus Hall. Our men's national basketball team coming off a loss against Venezuela, traveling to Argentina looking for a win as the World Cup qualifiers continuing. On the Argentinian home soil, however, seems as if they weren't playing gracious hosts. Things did not go as planned. Let's take a look. Men's national basketball team on the floor last night as they squared off against Argentina and the World Cup qualifiers. Bahamas hoping to pick up their first win after losing to Venezuela in the first game right here on home soil. Things went okay for the first half with the Bahamas up by one at the end of the first half of play. That, however, would not hold up. Second half, Argentina taking full control. They outscored the Bahamas 25-15 in the third and 27-18 in the fourth quarter to eventually go on for the win. 95-77 to ends up being the final score. Uh, the Bahamas now back to the drawing board as they get ready for the third game in this set when they'll face off at home here against Panama. 
Meanwhile, the UB men's soccer team hitting the pitch over the weekend in a scrimmage against Dynamos FC. Both sides gearing up for the upcoming soccer season. Dynamos are the defending champions in the Bahamas Football Association. New addition to the Mingo squad, Ronaldo Green. Missed out on a hat trick last week, but this week against a stronger side was able to pull it off. Sean Roll also scored two goals for the Mingos. The lead changed four times in the match, but it was the Mingos who eventually pulled off the win here. Final score five to four. Mingos assistant coach Adam Miller said the team was able to put together some of the things they worked on in practice, and it showed. A very, very difficult opponent, but it was a good test for us. Um, we went down a few times, had to try to claw ourselves back up. So it showed a lot of resilience for the players. Um, we did improve from the last game, what we wanted to do in, in the game, technically, tactically. Um, and sometimes I think with games like that, you get away from how you want to play and you kind of go back to the basics. And it showed that they do have a lot of grit and a lot of heart to try to claw, them, claw themselves back a few times to win the game. And that is your check on sports for you here on this Tuesday. I'm Marcellus Hall. Back to you, Italia. Thanks, Marcellus. Now don't go away as things continue to heat up in the tropics. As our Greg Thompson tells us, he's keeping an eye on several areas. Greg, what are we seeing? Yes, Italia, we are still monitoring two systems in the open Atlantic. The other two systems have been discontinued. Activity starting to ramp up. We will tell you more in our extended forecast. Thanks, Greg. And later, the Seabreeze constituency is the latest stop for the Wi-Fi in the Park program. That's coming up when our news returns. What we're doing is we seem to be saying to 80% of the student population, you're really not good enough. The PGCSE is a Bahamian exam. Your average is going to be around that high point, which is the D. Schools are churning out 5,000 children a year that need jobs. We're producing generations of Bahamians whose goal is to get out. Welcome back to our news. What are the chances of that disturbance in the tropics developing further? Well, meteorologist Greg Thompson is back in the weather center with the answer and a look ahead. Greg? Yes, Italia, we are still watching the tropics. Two systems out there in the open Atlantic that the hurricane center is continuing to monitor. The system uh, in the open Atlantic near Bermuda and the one in the Caribbean, the National Hurricane Center has dropped those two. But of concern, the uh, one approaching the Windward Islands, that is the one that we're going to keep a close eye on. All the models are indicating this system has a high chance for formation over the next seven days, five to seven days actually. Um, but they are keeping it really towards the uh, east of the islands as it approaches us and out in the open Atlantic. So we will continue to monitor that. Second one out there near the Cabo Verde Islands, that has a medium chance for formation over the next couple of days. But we will continue to watch these systems as they move towards the west. As I mentioned, the uh, tropical wave that's been interacting with the uh, upper level across the southeast Bahamas, triggering some showers and thunderstorms across there. That, uh, up, that system near the Yucatan Peninsula, the National Hurricane Center, not watching that for any formation at this time. The one has dissipated in the open Atlantic near Bermuda. But broad area of low pressure in the uh, central Atlantic associated with that uh, tropical wave. And the other one out there near the Cabo Verde Islands will continue to move towards the uh, west and eventually west-northwest over the next couple of days. And as I mentioned, should stay to the east of the islands by the end of the weekend into early next week. But we will continue to keep you abreast as to the progress of these systems. Boating forecast for the northwest and central Bahamas tonight through tomorrow. Your winds will be out of the southeast to south at 10 to 15 knots. They will fall light and verbal at times across the northwest Bahamas. Seas running 2 to 4 feet over the ocean. Your high tide will be at 1044 tonight. For the southeast Bahamas, winds are a little stiff out there, east to southeast at 15 knots, and your wave heights will be running 3 to 5 feet over open waters. Here's a look now at your national forecast. In your extended forecast, showers in the forecast, and some isolated thunderstorms Wednesday and Thursday, clearing up by Friday, then we see an increase in some moisture by the early part of next week. But we will continue to watch that system in the open Atlantic, as I mentioned, should stay east of the islands by that time. 
That's a look at our weather. Make it a safe night, everybody. Thanks so much, Greg. Seabreeze is the newest constituency to receive Wi-Fi at one of its parks. Area MP Leslie Miller Bryce was at an event to mark the launch of Wi-Fi services at the Charles Carter Park, showing constituents how to get connected. We have free Wi-Fi, yes. so I want everyone to pull out their phones. Yeah, I connect. Uh, it's yes, it's connected. Oh, it's you gotta find it first. It's Let's find it now. Oh, right there. You find it, Miss Iva? Wi-Fi! Wi-Fi! The Wi-Fi in the Parks project began its rollout on August 1st, with the Davis administration pledging to provide free Wi-Fi internet access to at least one park in every constituency in the Bahamas. Head of Government Innovations at Cable Bahamas Business Solution, Javier Bo. We at Cable Bahamas have been pleasure, had the pleasure of doing the Park Connect with the government along with other ISPs. So this is in, in a part of the government's program so to ensure that they have Wi-Fi available in every constituency at at least one park in each constituency. So we're pleased to be a part of this, this initiative. Thank you for joining us for our news tonight. On behalf of the entire team, I'm Natalia Hall. We'll see you right back here tomorrow night. Have a beautiful evening, Bahamas.